Burton Goldberg's mutiny at Sailboat Bay was one of the country's most lucrative hotels, perennially overbooked and sending off armored trucks with sacks of its cash profits, albeit in the new murder and drug capital of America, a city that had been ravaged by race riots, gun killings, and the sudden arrival of 125,000 Cuban refugees, many of them sprung right from Fidel Castro's jails. By the turn of the decade, the 130-room hotel and club was a criminal free trade zone of sorts, where gangsters could both revel in Miami's danger and escape from it. All roads led back to the mutiny, said Wayne Black, an undercover cop who listened in to dope deals from a tinted van across the street, often wearing nothing but BVDs to cope with the stifling heat and humidity. The druggies, he said, the celebs... The crooked pals, spies, the informants, cops, good and bad, were all there. America in the late 1970s and early 80s was in a pronounced funk. Inflation and unemployment were high. Consumer sentiment was in the dumps. But so exceptional was Miami's cocaine economy that dopers were paying banks to accept suitcases full of cash, while certificates of deposit were yielding 20% on top of your choice of toaster or alarm clock. According to one study from Florida International University in Miami, at least one-third of the city's economic output was derived from narcotics at the time. So much hot money was sloshing around Miami that the mutiny was selling more bottles of Dom Perignon than any other establishment on the planet, according to the Bubbly's distributor, whose executives visited in disbelief at the turn of the decade. They heard right. A suite at the hotel was converted into a giant walk-in cooler. Beautiful women would ooh and ah at tabletop cascades of bubbly and stacks of flutes. Dopers bought bottles for the house when their loads came in, and management often flew out the mutiny's private plane at the last minute to procure even more from other cities. Internationally wanted hitmen and mercenaries chilled the mutiny. Frequent visitors kept their guns tucked in the cushions and cases of cash and cocaine in their suites. Bullets flew. Thugs were nabbed. Refugees snuck in. Cops were bribed. Dopers were recorded. Pilots were hired. Contracts were placed. Plots were hatched. You might recognize this backdrop as the Babylon Club in the movie Scarface, whose creators Oliver Stone and Brian De Palma stayed the mutiny and sought permission to film there. In Stone's screenplay, he accidentally referenced the Mutiny Club. Stars Al Pacino, Stephen Bauer, and other supporting cast checked in at the hotel. Miami Vice stars were also gravitationally pulled to the mutiny. Don Johnson partied there, and Philip Michael Thomas moved in with his family and insisted on parking his purple imitation Ferrari out front on the curb. The hit show's creators studied agents and kingpins at the mutiny. One cooperating drug lord even finagled his way onto two episodes. The Miami of the mutiny's heyday abounded with the surreal. So much marijuana was getting confiscated in the waters around South Florida that the Florida Power and Light Company was opportunistically burning tons of it to run its generators. 732 pounds of pot could replace a barrel of crude. Take that energy crisis. Area McDonald's restaurants were running out of their tiny spoon-tipped coffee stirrers. They were perfect, it turned out, for portioning and sniffing cocaine. Mutiny dopers wore bronzed ones around their necks to advertise how far they'd come. Burger King, meanwhile, loaned the overwhelmed county morgue a refrigerated truck. Bodies were turning up in gator-infested canals, in duffel bags alongside the turnpike, bobbing out of drums, bins, and shopping carts in marinas along Biscayne Bay. Machine gun fire rained over the parking lot of the city's busiest mall, all of which would soon land Miami on the cover of Time magazine as Paradise Lost. The mutiny stood out as a lush oasis within this apocalypse. The magic city was now the planet's cocaine entrepot. Its Federal Reserve branch was showing a $5 billion cash surplus, 
And so this hotel and club became the place south of Studio 54 to blow a legal tender. The club's $75 metal membership card embossed with the mutiny's winking pirate logo got you in the door and certainly came in handy for cutting and snorting lines. But it was cash, lots and lots of it, that got you everything else. Cases of $150 a bottle Dom Perignon emptied into your hot tub right away. A private jet for jaunts to the island stocked with mutiny girls, a five-man crew, and stone crab claws and dry ice? No sweat. Your machine guns, bullets, and silencers discreetly locked in a chest? Sin problema. Plus, a hostess would hide your piece in her skirt if the cops showed up, while another mutiny girl was adept at clicking her stilettos against guys on the dance floor to check for ankle holsters. We couldn't just walk into the mutiny with a cheap rubber watch, said Wayne Black, the undercover cop, who would borrow a Rolex from the police evidence locker before going there. You'd be buying Dom with the bad guys. You owned a Pinto but drove home a Jag. Daddy, your kid would say, the neighbors say you sell drugs. None of which would ever make the press release that the otherwise media-shy mutiny felt the need to put out to start 1981 the year when Miami became America's murder capital. <laughs>